Hi, my name is uh, Peter McCarthy, and I'm going to show you a bit about modeling today, and then also the domestic house extension. Um, one of the things in the steering group which we kind of wanted to do was not just uh, give presentations for advanced users, whether they cover the range from beginners to advanced, uh, and then also from small projects to large, pro large projects, uh, commercial projects. So this is kind of covering the kind of beginner uh, type person, uh, the small house extensions, which can easily be done, right? it's not just for big projects. Now I was told that uh, because of my accent I might need to have subtitles on the presentation. <laughs> so at any point, if you don't understand me, I'm probably saying one of these two things. All right, so I'm going to firstly talk about uh, a bit about modeling before we go into the house extension. And a lot of time you'll hear people say it's all about the I and BIM. And uh, I think it probably is for the most part, but the I is, means different things for different people. And not everyone knows what to do with the I. And one, one thing that is constant is the modeling or the M. Uh, also, for the model, uh, uses of the model or how well the, the model is built, uh, it's used for uh, clash detection. The accuracy. I have a simple diagram here which shows two types of modeling. One which is a one wall that's in the same position for uh, top to bottom, but it's modeled as just one item, and then a second wall which is modeled on each level. Uh, what this shows, uh, if you model like this on the left, um, if you have a 10 story building or 11 story building, and the slabs are uh, 300 mil thick, and then floor to floor is uh, 3 meters. What effectively you're doing is you're adding in the quantities a whole extra floor in that model. Uh, so when the quantity of area is trying to you know, price it up, uh, there's actually a whole extra floor of, of the interiors. So modeling does, it does matter, it does count towards the building information modeling part. Um, Just to where I'm at, so you're going to understand uh, where I'm kind of my knowledge is coming from. I'm using Reva for about five years. The largest project was probably about 20 million, and I've only really worked with about three three people uh, on a project. And this slide kind of ties in with the next slide, which is uh, how many attempts did it take me to achieve BIM, or where I'm at with BIM. Um, and this, this also does relate to modeling as well. Uh, so I started off with you know, the 3D model in Revit and then I cut it up and then drew up the lines in AutoCAD. Um, but then, you know, moving towards BIM, uh, from a beginner point of view, uh, you want to start using the, the automatic, automatic uh, tags, tag by category. So I started to do that, do that much. But then I realized uh, the way I was modeling uh, didn't allow for uh, BIM so much because I was modeling to make it look right. Didn't mean that when I did the schedules, uh, it would give me the right kind of, uh, quantities and stuff like that. Um, so, as I was working through it, I was revising my model methodology. And then, as I kind of come further down, uh, I started working with other consultants, importing their models. Um, and that, that brings itself another type of modeling where you have to split up the elements so that other uh, consultants can take ownership of objects such as uh, structural floors versus floor finishes, things like that. Um, and as a beginner, when you're coming to uh, the presentations, you see quite an advanced presentation, you're kind of trying to figure out how do I catch up, uh, what should I do to catch up. Um, <coughs> So it's important to kind of uh, set out a plan from when you're a beginner to kind of where you want to be. And where I'm at now is uh, watching the guys at the last couple of presentations. They're all talking about Kobe and FM and you know adaptive components and APIs. And I haven't done any of that, so it's kind of I already feel quite far behind, even though I'm kind of fairly advanced. Um, just going to talk about two or three. Uh, modeling approaches. Uh, now these are kind of uh, made up words. If you Google them, you're not actually going to find it. 
Well, one thing I find that is the um, biggest thing I, I hear from new people moving into Revit is, well, you have to know everything before you start modeling. And that, that somewhat helps, but it's not the only method. Um, but what is good, if you want to make a move from uh, CAD into Revit, uh, it can be good to do this approach for the first uh, couple of times. I want to find is if you do a detail that you've already built, uh, it really helps. Um, <clears throat> kind of cut off here, but basically if you want to make that shift over, uh, some of the questions that you have, you know, if the, mod if the detail isn't really working or you can't get the model quite correct, you kind of, you know, can I actually build the detail? What does it look like? Does the software not work? You have all these questions in your head that you're trying to figure out. Um, if you pick a detail you've done before, you know you know it works, so you don't have to worry about trying to figure out how to detail it. Uh, you know what it looks like, and then what you can do is just concentrate on your modeling. Uh, so you just purely get gaining skills of modeling. It's quite useful. Um, I have this method which I teach uh, kind of new people in my office, where we take the detail and we annotate every single item. The next step then is to just add a number beside each item, so you list absolutely everything in it. And then when you have the, the number and the detail, you then just kind of fill in a table. So you list, the number is just linking the table to the detail. You list what the object is, and now you're kind of starting to decide whether or not it's 2D or 3D. So you're just starting to think, how am I going to model this? You're kind of starting to make a plan of action. Um, you're then going to decide on what kind of Revit tool you're going to use. So is it a floor, is it a curtain wall? And then if you want to, you could then even put the family type in. And then what that does is it builds kind of a self-made tutorial on uh, how to build that detail. So it's quite useful. Um, this is just... Uh, some other things you can get from already having details. You can pick up things like grid lines and reference planes, which you might want to draw in to help you modeling. You can actually get the full object position, exact coordinates, uh, or else you can pick up the 2D items, which are like annotation, text, detail components. Um, I find this this part of this this approach uh, quite useful. I call it system family check, but what you do is you draw as many rectangles over your detail and that means uh, all the system families are they're basically uh, rectangles um, so you can now look at quite a difficult detail and you're not quite sure how to model it um, draw as many rectangles as possible you then realize you now you have a couple of floors you have a wall, another wall, another floor and uh, what it does is it highlights out the difficult parts of modeling uh, so you can see here that uh, it's a tricky shape, maybe I should do it as a profile and sweep it around the wall. Uh, there's another part here, which, uh, do I model it as another wall? Do I, uh, do I unlock some of the layers within the wall and drag them down? Or you know, do I pull the whole wall down and join it with the floor, hoping the floor will cut it? I didn't quite give you the answers, but... Uh, it does kind of help you out, and you can see here that 90% of the detail is actually covered with system families. Uh, so it's really useful to kind of do that if you're kind of struggling. The downside to that, that approach is you have to know uh, a lot of information uh, before you start, and <coughs> the general workflow of a, a Revit user won't really allow for time uh, to do all that. So it's good if you want to convert over, but I don't uh, recommend it full time. Um, one of the ways I do model uh, is relationship modeling. So now starting to uh, put uh, kind of find a object that is the object that sets out everything else. Um, so in this case, it's just a simple uh, a detail. But grid line sets out the center of the beam, the beam sets out the edge of the floor, and then the floor sets out the edge of the, uh, the curtain wall. 
it's kind of what's now uh, related is the curtain wall is now related to the edge of the beam, not necessarily the grid line. So, uh, what which object has priority? So then you pick maybe the beam has priority. Um, so that's the first object that goes in. And then what that means is you can trace the edge. It helps you speed up time because you're not trying to figure out sort of where does the curtain wall start. You know, there's other objects that will help you uh, help you along the path. Um, just going to list a couple of other uh, approaches. Um, there is the approach where you can kind of model the base geometry, kind of get your designer to model the base geometry and then analyze how the geometry is coming together afterwards. Um, and then another approach is modeling by trade. Uh, I find this, this one quite useful for collaborative uh, workflow because what you do is you tend to split up the model uh, like the wood in the construction site and then you give the consultants uh, sorry, um, like you split up the floor uh, with the structural slab and then the floor finish. Uh, it works quite similar to construction site. So the structural engineer takes the structural slab, architect takes the floor finish and what you find is when you start extracting the walls in together, the ownership rights, uh, it's much easier to kind of decide, well you take this and I'll take this and uh, it works quite well. Um, so now I'm going to move on to the house extension. Uh, to talk about the, the two, kind of two approaches which I generally take, I either do a five stage approach, which is uh, doing a basic model for kind of planning and then doing an advanced model for construction. But for something this small, I'll generally just do a three-stage one, which is uh, it's kind of an advanced model for both planning and, and construction because it's, it's so small. Um, I'm not going to read through all this, but if you're a beginner and you want to kind of get into it, uh, I've listed out kind of a general workflow which you can follow, uh, follow along if, if you'd like. Uh, so it starts off with just setting up the model, uh, then it's followed by the modeling phase, which I try to get uh, completely finished before I move on to the annotation stage. Do the basic annotation, which is a planning model, and then when it moves forward for construction, then I'll come back and do some more detailed modeling, and then uh, it's cut off, but more detailed annotation. Um, so this is our house, it's my brother's house. Uh, it's uh, it's a two-story building and there's a kitchen and dining in the back with a patio door. And the idea would be that you knock out the patio door and then you build your extension on. Uh, and then this is the general uh, headings of the topics that are coming up next. Um, to start off, you need to build the existing uh, house. And what I generally find is um, the paint tool is quite useful. Uh, to apply the texture or the material to the wall without actually building several different wall types that you don't even know what it's constructed of um, unless you, you know, break it open and see what's inside. So what I'll generally do is use a basic wall and then I'll use the paint tool and I'll apply brickwork on the outside, apply you know, paint, uh, white paint on the inside. And that, that kind of helps you build up the existing house without actually committing yourself to too much detail. Um, so keep it simple, keep it quite generic, uh, and then use the paint tool to kind of help you uh, apply what the actual building looks like. Um, windows, uh, existing windows, this is a bit of a kind of a cheat. Um, the window family generally takes anywhere between about an hour and a half three hours to build uh, the real the real pain. Um, so for existing windows, if you want to build them uh, quite fast or gain some speed, uh, we will model them as curtain walls in some cases. Now, there is a downfall to that, that it, it's not a window category, uh, so if you do schedules, it's quite difficult to uh, capture them. But 
uh, if it's existing window and you're not going to schedule it, then it can be quite easy to use and it gains, gains you about two hours uh, in time. The only thing you need to do for the, uh, the curtain wall itself is in its type properties, the automatically embed needs to be selected. So then when you draw your window, uh, it automatically cuts its own shape out of the wall. Um, and then all you do is you add curtain grids just to, to place extra grids. And then you can quickly draw up the window breakdown uh, using different size mullions and different size panels. Um, this for me is probably, uh, this is a kind of a general workflow, uh, not workflow, um, kind of decisions that when two objects come together, which object has more priority. Uh, this kind of looks the most correct, it might necessarily be the most correct, but it kind of gives me the most uh, correct outcome where the roof will cut the wall, the wall will cut the floor slab, the floor slab will cut the interior walls. Um, and by having this list and kind of understanding this list, uh, what that does is whenever you come across this situation in, say, in a large project, you know straight away which option you're going to go for. Am I going to do this? Uh, am I going to cut the floor? Am I going to you know, shorten the wall? Um, and I find that this is probably changing level. If you, have, if you can understand these rules and you, you're applying them uh, between a beginner and intermediate, um, this, this saves quite a lot of time just standing there looking at the, the model, you kind of go, okay, I know what I'm doing, so just apply it. So this is, a, this is kind of a quite important one for me. Um, so the demolition tool, uh, it's on the manage tab, which is here, um, and so you select your object to demolish it. But what happens when you do that, uh, instead of being an uh, opening, which would happen in real life, um, Revit now thinks that, okay, I'll fill it in with the same wall type, uh, which is not what I want. Uh, so basically, you have to demolish it and then come over, and what we'll do is we'll uh, set up some reference planes and then place a wall opening, which will effectively reopen the uh, opening. It's kind of a it's a real pain, and the, the, wall, the wall openings are actually probably my least favourite tool because they tend to uh, not snap to anything, so it's quite, quite annoying. Um, so now we're going to move on to the new construction. Uh, you, know, you are best to make a plan of attack if you can, um, but you're not necessarily going to have all the information before you start. But if you can make a plan, uh, it's good to follow because uh, you can tend to get kind of lost when you're modeling and then you just stare at 3D for too long. Uh, so if you make the plan, follow it, it's good. Um, there's a couple of different ways you can approach uh, putting two different walls on top of each other. Um, in this case, it's, it's quite an old structure, it's going to be two, uh, two, two leaves of uh, block work or concrete infill. And then on top has the insulation and all the rest. Um, the first option is in the wall type itself, you can apply the different materials, or it could be a, sorry, a compound wall, um, where you have two different wall types. Uh, the only problem I find with that is uh, this generally has to be a constant, or it forces it to be a constant, uh, constant height. So if you've stepped uh, back garden and you've stepped the foundation, the wall will actually just lower uh, this line up and down with it, which is not necessarily what you want. The other option is to model two walls and then just use the align tool and just line them up. Uh, I draw, I draw uh, when I draw the wall, so I, generally I don't have too much regard for the height. What I'll do is I'll just place them and I'll always have a working section which I move around as a, as a model. I'll just fix the height uh, instead of having to spend lots of time calculating the height. I kind of let the model and, and let it do the work. Um, the next one, uh, you would expect uh, all the tools to kind of 
work fully uh, because you expect the software to work correctly. Um, so what, in this case, what I've done is I've added the foundation and I know there's an existing foundation which sticks out a little bit. So I wanted to just drag the edge of the foundation back and you find that it's not working and 15 minutes later, I'm still trying it. 20 minutes later, I'm still there. And then you're just like, what, what's going on? Uh, so in some cases, you are going to have to seek out alternative solutions. And in this case, this is actually just the floor that's drawn. Uh, which kind of gives you the correct look, but it's not necessarily the correct category, things like that. The other item is that if you're working with a structured engineer, he's going to model the foundations anyway. So how long does it take him to delete my 30 minute foundation versus my uh, three minute foundation? It's going to take him two seconds for both. So, you know, sometimes you don't have to be too precious about some of the modeling if you know it's going to be overtaken by someone else. Um, there is an over accurate issue uh, with Revit. Um, it's basically, my door has gone in and it stops at the uh, floor finish. Uh, my slab goes in, stops at the floor finish. Um, but my actual tiling will go out right to the door edge, just somewhere along here. Uh, but because Revit is so accurate, uh, you can't really have this object in in this location as well, otherwise you have a floor and a slab kind of crossing over. So then what you have to do sometimes is uh, you either cheese a little bit, which is uh, you raise up the floor five mil up and you have a second floor that is a different boundary to the, the main floor. Um, but you will find that you start to get all these, because Revit wants to be so accurate, you do get these extra lines even though they shouldn't really uh, it wouldn't naturally exist. Um, I'm not going to speak too much on Windows. They're generally uh, kind of pretty standard. The only thing is, if you want to do some kind of feature corner windows, uh, you actually have to go into the window family, and instead of using the typical uh, opening cut, which is in here, which is in the standard window. Um, you actually have to model a void and then cut the void out of this uh, temporary wall that's in the family. And then when you load that in, uh, but so, sorry, I didn't explain it to begin with. If you don't do this, uh, this window will only cut this wall, it won't cut this wall as well. So it's only going to cut one wall. So then you have to put in another opening to uh, cut out this geometry. So to get around that, if you go into the family, you can actually model the void, cut the wall, so it knows that any wall that it touches is going to cut with the with the void. That's how you get get through. Uh, so you model this as a single item uh, and cut both walls. Um, the roof. I always uh, found this trick about five years ago. Uh, where you separate out the, the roof tiles from the rafters. And the reason being, uh, I'll just show you this detail over here, is if you didn't separate it out, the extra layers inside of the roof will come down to this end boundary line, which is in yellow. Uh, but if you actually look at the detail, the, the rafter actually stops further in. And you can't, uh, you can't really, just, it's not like a wall where you can unlock the edges and pull it in. It doesn't really work with roofs. Uh, so I find it's best just to completely leave them out and then either model them as individual elements or you know, use 2D means to cover it. Um, one of the great secrets, uh, I think the, the secrets, uh, is some of the, the sweeps that are uh, they're already in Revit, but they're kind of hidden away. So if you select the drop-down lists, uh, you get some extra fascia, uh, soffit, and I think the other one is gutter. And you can do some really nice stuff with them. Uh, and what I find is, uh, you see here everything in blue is, is basically a sweep that's on, it's under one of these uh, tool headings that I've used. Uh, but you can get some nice flashings it's generally a quite difficult to model, uh, but 
by using these tools they naturally follow the roof line. We've changed the roof line and it updates. So it's quite easy. Uh, but they're quite difficult to put together. So what I generally do is I draw my shape of the gutter or fascia, it's generally fascias, uh, just 2D drafting lines. And then I also draw an extra line, which is just highlighting to me where my origin is going to be. So if you know your Revit tool, you know it's, you, can pick, you can pick an edge, then this is going to be the origin of my profile. Uh, you copy the 2D lines, including this line, into a profile family, and then you drop it in, and you drop in the center into the correct location. You then just delete this line, and you load that profile back in. Then you can now attach that profile to the fascia tool, uh, and look something like this, and then just attach it to the roof, and it'll give you a nice exact detail. If you wanted to, uh, you could dimension all this, add more reference planes, and make it parametric. Uh, if it's a one-off, and you, know, you have 10 minutes to do it, you can just leave it like this, and drop it in. Uh, it does mean, though, that the roof is a different distance from the wall, you're not going to be able to fix it. You have to go back in and edit it again. So you have to kind of pick and choose which, uh, which option you want to go down. If you're doing it repeatedly, you probably want to make it parametric. It's also, uh, it's also great for ridge tiles as well. It's a different type of profile. But you're using a fascia tool again. Um, I did this, I did all the rafters uh, kind of by hand. Uh, it took me about five, six hours. <laughs> It's a complete waste of time, but uh, so you have to you have to kind of make a decision whether it's beneficial to model it, or whether that the extra geometry is actually going to help you find something else out. Uh, in this case, didn't really need to do it, but I did it for for the project. Um, so I would kind of recommend that uh, there is a point where stops being productive and starts going downhill. Uh, so you have to kind of figure it out to what's best for the project and what's best for the output uh, that you're going to uh, provide. Uh, this is extra little tricky bits. I generally always make um, a wall type that's just a single layer of plasterboard. Uh, see it here in section. Um, for the awkward pieces, that uh, need to be modelled to kind of cover up uh, openings, um, but they're quite difficult to find. So what I generally will do is I'll start off by placing some reference planes, and then I'll always draw a section kind of in front of where I'm going to uh, place the wall type, uh, model, my, model, model my wall and plan, and then go into section view and then edit the profile and then just trace trace the outline. And then what you're left with is, you know, a closed off detail. Um, sometimes what I also do is on the ceilings I remove the the kind of stud layer. Because uh, what will happen is if you have a stud layer with with your this is the ceiling here, if you have a stud layer with it, um, the boundary line of the ceiling is going to be the same. So this stud layer will also come out here. And then what that does is It'll add extra lines uh, in your elevations, which you don't necessarily want. Uh, <coughs> so, some of the tools you'd like to be able to pull them back, or you'd like to be able to join them, and they'll cut different parts out. But uh, with the ceilings, it doesn't quite work uh, yet. Uh, so then we've kind of completed our uh, modeling phase. We've got the roof in. Got everything else in. Then move on to the annotation stage. Um, I try to aim for about 80% modeling and then about 20% uh, annotation. It doesn't, doesn't always work out that way. Um, but I find that 80% modeling uh, you tend to get less, you tend to have to do less kind of graphical fixes. Uh, and every graphical fix you do, if you change the design, it, it might mean that, that that time was wasted and you have to do it again. Uh, so if you just compare the two, two different, uh, so the modeling is finished and then this is when the annotation is added. 
Um, what's in here is a couple of fill regions, kind of showing the earth text, uh, dimensions, spot heights. Uh, fortunately, it's kind of cut off here. Um, there is the annotation tab <coughs> pretty much rivals AutoCAD. Uh, you could probably do your drawings in Revit in 2D better than AutoCAD. Um, and if you want to, you can download this presentation afterwards. Uh, and I've kind of done some comparisons to the AutoCAD elements like lines and hatch and given the equivalent uh, name in, in Revit. So the hatch is uh, region, you know, block is component. Uh, so if you're not too familiar with it, you can come in and have a look at it. Um, I find there's four different types of annotation that I use to kind of express the, uh, the objects. Um, and they all, they all have their upsides and their downsides. You have your traditional uh, notation or just text and the only problem is that if this construction changes and you forget to update the text, uh, then, then you're, you're cut out. It's, it's very much like uh, the AutoCAD way. Um, there is the automatic tags, uh, which are good, which tag each wall. The only thing you need to do when you do this is you have to make a legend, and the legend has to be correct and updated. Uh, the one thing I did find with automatic tags, it doesn't kind of help you uh, explain items that are very particular to that particular detail. Uh, so you want to align, it, align a wall with a column. You can't really do that for an automatic tag. The tag only tells you what wall type it is. Um, so to add then extra notes, uh, there is the sheet keynote, uh, which is, uh, trying to remember, it's a symbol. And then the symbol is uh, scheduled, and you have two parts to the symbol. You have the, the number itself, and then as a second parameter, we've added a description. Uh, so what it does is it'll schedule off just the number, and then have the description beside it. So you can add extra notes, like uh, a lot, yeah, like align the, the wall to the column. And you can just drop them in. It's kind of like notes by number a little bit. Uh, does have its downfall if if you have the same number of two different descriptions, it, it tends to get confused and just goes blank. So then you have to unitemize uh, all the items and then find out which is the correct one. And then the kind of the last one that I generally use is the keynotes, which is kind of linked to a text file on the database. And again, it's kind of done through uh, automatic tags. It's similar to automatic tags, but you can now actually add extra different bits of uh, to notes to the tag. So tagging this, it's, it's F10, and then I'll have a description of what it is afterwards. Someone has to maintain that text text file for the project. Uh, I think you probably need uh, an individual file for each project as the, the notes change. Um, and then I'm coming to the end of the presentation. Uh, actually, just go back to the, the notation. I was just wondering, does anyone else have a, any other types of annotation that they use to you, mention? You've got labels, which can get around done text in the, the notation section, where right. if you create a label that's either instance or type, that can be accessed in the project, placed on sheet, and then that kind of negates the need to do find and replace. Right. Okay. So for maintaining the same note, you know, mm -hmm. the, may not talk to model geometry, you may be talking about, say, in you know, a site plan, something like the neighbor's house, which you haven't modeled. So there's that method. Right. You can also put in your tags an instant parameter for comments. All right, okay. Yeah, you can use multi-category tag. You can create a multi-category tag that goes to comments, or type comments. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually use, use that to either put the comments in the 3D Pull it out of 3D element. Also, if you're using, you use um, the fill regions as annotation on 2D, you can do the same thing. Right. You can actually have a comment and use the multi use the multi catch to pull that out. So, as well, uh, you just said you can drive your keynotes from an export of an NBS building. So right. You can take a spec and use that to, as a possible to drive that text out. 
so then, uh, not going to really discuss you know the, the approach to annotating every single uh, different type of drawing, but you know you will add detail components such as uh, wall ties, just sometimes to make the detail look better. Uh, it, it never model any of kind of extra detail. Um, I think there's a general rule that the object is seen in two different types of views, then you should model it. So if it's seen in plan and section, you should probably model it. If it's only seen in plan, such as maybe a wall tie, then there's no need to 3D model it. Uh, and that also includes elevations and 3D views as the four types of views that you can, if, you, if it's in one of them views, uh, you might need to model it or not. Uh, I did I did think I would mention the part still because uh, it relates to modeling. Uh, I don't really like it as a tool. Uh, I've never really kind of fully understood it and uh, I think when there's something, when there's an object that's dividing the part in the middle, uh, I find it difficult to understand how, it, how, how to cut that out. Uh, and then what it also does is it leaves two states. It leaves the original wall shape, and then it has a second state, which is the modified heights of the block work or the outside layer. Um, and you have an option to show, show the parts, show the original, or show both. And the reason why I have a problem with it is if you give the model to another consultant, and they haven't set their view to parts, then they're seeing the wall that's in the wrong state. Uh, so I don't really like it for that that reason, um, but uh, you should research it up, and if you, you know, it does do some nice things as well uh, with the ability to pull down uh, the tops and bottoms of walls, and same thing happens with the floors. Um, and I've added uh, some leaving uh, to DC. <laughs> I've added some extra tips and tricks. I'm not going to go through them, uh, but it's going to be up on the Outerug website uh, for the next week. Um, so if you want to get on, if you're a beginner and you want to get on, I have kind of three headings of tips for beginners. Um, then BIM Model Manager, kind of some uh, bits of advice from just the, the work that I did uh, the last couple of years. And then if you're doing multi-category, uh, so multidisciplinary projects where you're working with other consultants. Uh, I found some tips uh, that will help you when you're reloading models and you get updated models, what to do with them. Uh, so again, this is all going to be in the presentation. You can download it from the website. And let's do a final thanks to Alan and the gang, and the usual Elrug suspects. And this guy, uh, I found this guy all about it. Uh, you got to watch out for him. He's, uh, it's Kevin Spacey's character. <laughs> Something wrong there. David's talking about me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Funny enough, David was uh, black and white when he started. So that's what the phone is. And then, uh, questions then? <coughs> what did your brother think? Oh, he loved it. I think he's stepping on top to, because uh, there's a house in the States. All the same houses, he's going to sell it to people. <laughs> any any other, other questions then on uh, modeling or you know, getting into Revit, getting into BIM? The only thing you haven't really said is that that project, you've got the whole of those videos on that project oh, yeah, on your, web, right, yeah. on your blog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have, a, I think it's about 10, ten sequence of videos uh, of me basically modeling up that house and showing you actually, uh, it's a bit easier to watch a video than just read text uh, when you're following it. Then what, what happens is people skip steps in the text, so then you're kind of like, how did they get there? But when you're watching the videos, you can actually see them clicking on certain things they didn't say they were clicking on. Uh, so you can go onto the website, uh, it's rev detail, you can Google it, uh, and go back and look at the that project. There's also a second project, which is much larger projects with 25 videos, uh, which basically I'd spend about 20 minutes on each topic, such as ceilings, floors, columns, extra kind of forcey concrete uh, detailing. Uh, so if you want to get into modeling, you can 
we're going to take a look at that. Okay.